Hello everyone, hope all is well. I have a treat for you today. Uh, we are going to be continuing our look at some of um, uh, Grandmaster uh, Sergei uh, Tivyakov's games in the uh, Scandinavian defense, specifically the Queen um, D6 a variation on move three. So instead of Queen A5 uh, variation or on move two, Knight f6, we are looking at queen d6. Um, this is what uh, Tivyakov played uh, mostly throughout his entire uh, career of playing this opening. Um, again, I recommend uh, studying a uh, specialist uh, if you really want to uh, uh, know uh, an opening, you know, find a chess guru, somebody that plays your favorite opening all the time and just hop on board and just uh, follow through their games and learn uh, from their struggles. Uh, Tivyakov is, is and was a great exponent of the uh, Queen um, D6 variation in the Scandinavian. Uh, he's made some DVDs on it. Um, uh, and he's played it at the highest levels. Uh, you know, all the top grandmasters. Uh, today, we are going to look at uh, two games um with the white pieces in these two games uh, uh grandmaster uh is grandmaster alexei uh, shirov formerly of the um <clears throat> latvian province in the uh old soviet uh union actually he's from riga the same place uh, uh the great champion uh, tal uh, is from and he actually studied under tal so those of you who are familiar with uh, shirov's very aggressive style uh, can perhaps see where he would get that from. So just a little bit about Shirov, in case you're not familiar with him. Um, he was number two in the world uh, at his peak in January 1994. He became Grandmaster in 91. Um, he was born on Independence Day, uh, in American Independence Day, July 4th, uh, 1972. Um, and I think his peak was um, late 90s. Uh, as far as his chest strength was concerned, um, he actually defeated Vladimir Kramnik in 1998 for the right to play as challenger for the World Chess Championship against Garry Kasparov. And that match did not take place for lack of sponsorship. Uh, I actually made a video about that you could look up. Uh, and it says, um, I think it's something like, um, was Shirov robbed of his chance at the title? So, something dramatic like that. I don't know what I was thinking about at the time. But I made a, a two-part video series that goes into uh, the reasons and the circumstances around the uh, Kramnik-Shirov uh, match that took place. Uh, Shirov played a fantastic match, defeated Kramnik, who was also uh, in his peak at the time. And as you know, Kramnik would go on to defeat uh, Gary Kasparov uh, in a match in uh, 2000 uh, for the World uh, Chess Championship. So that match was actually the match that Shirov was supposed to play, but for a plethora of reasons, uh, mainly being lack of sponsorship, lack of uh, interest in that match, uh, Shirov was not given that title shot, which uh, probably was a great uh, motivational blow to his career. After all, you work your whole life to get up to that point and then, um, you know, just to be turned away from la for lack of sponsorship, lack of interest. Uh, part of the lack of interest, um, the, the reason for the lack of interest in that match was that Shirov just had an absolutely dismal record against Kasparov at that time. I think... Um, I don't think he ever defeated Kasparov, and he had a slew of losses and some draws mixed in. He might have been, you can look this up yourself, I'm not going to uh, look it up, but it was something, um, you know, really lopsided at the time. Maybe he had like nine losses to Kasparov and, you know, a few draws. So the interest wasn't there for the sponsors, and Kasparov wasn't interested either. Uh, he uh, made some disparaging remarks about uh, Shirov. But nevertheless, uh, Shirov was a great, or is still a great player, um, a very strong player. And who knows what he would have been able to accomplish. After all, Bobby Fischer had never defeated Boris Spassky uh, in a classical game until they played in the World Championship. So uh, you never know 
what someone will do when given the opportunity. So let's look at the first of these two games. Uh, again, Shiroff has the white pieces. Grandmaster Tivyakov, uh, the specialist in the Scandinavian, has the black pieces. And I want to share with you an interesting line that uh, Shirov employs that is a sort of offbeat that uh, you can uh, use against the Scandinavians. Very aggressive, very aggressive. Uh, if you like to play like Tal and Shirov and Marizevich and that spirit, this line is definitely something you should consider. So after our initial moves, e4, d5, e takes d5, queen takes d5, knight c3, queen d6, Sim simply d4. Knight of six, knight of three. So nothing hard to remember. Just classical uh, setup. There's c6, and now it's this line with the immediate knight uh, e5 here. Okay, black responds knight bd7, and this is related to uh, a lot of ideas. Some ideas in the Slav where uh, black tries to eliminate the threat on knight e5 immediately. And um, white wants to keep the pieces on the board, so white will often play moves like knight c4 here, queen c7, for example. And in this line, you have queen f3, knight b6, bishop f4, and that's one uh, possible continuation. Another popular continuation, uh, instead of knight c4, is just the direct the bishop f4. And then you see knight d5. And then one continuation is just knight takes d5. Queen takes d5. And you'll see knight f3 again preserving the pieces. Knight b6 which allows this guy to come out to uh, f5. Idea you see in the Carol Khan. Remember this is a Carol Slav structure. So a lot of ideas you see in the Slav defense and Carol Khan will... Uh, uh, be useful in the Scandinavian. Another idea, of course, after bishop f4, knight d5, knight takes. Another option is black has this knight takes e5 here, knight e3 check, knight d3, to, uh, knight d3 check, queen d uh, takes d3, and queen takes f4. Again, all different um, ideas out of the opening. But Sherov, again, keeps it very simple. And this is one of the reasons why I think you find this line interesting. Is uh, he just simply plays f4. His argument here, of course, is that uh, black does not really want to exchange at this point. All right? Because he would open up the f file and give uh, white a lot of space here. So... The line goes knight b6, and this is what Tivyakov played. And knight b6, just like in the other variation, it clears the way for the bishop to appear on f5. So, Shirov plays g4. Very aggressive uh, move. And the pawn is supported by the queen on d1 and the knight on e5. And black has trouble developing in a way that he would uh, like to now as you can see the downside of this is that white uh, has weakened uh, his king side uh, somewhat right to be nice about it bishop e6 from tivyakov bishop g2 g6 and here uh, shirov decides to castle a4 is an interesting alternative also here to uh, kick the knight uh, on a5. But castle is uh, good also. Now here, uh, the usual suspects that apply in the Scandinavian are present for white. Okay, he has a large uh, space advantage here and it's somewhat exaggerated uh, a little bit more than in the other lines because of the aggressive nature of white's play on the king side so we can see black is very solid as he usually is in these type of structures but he must be careful not to get overwhelmed and uh, pushed off the board so although he's solid he must um, uh, stand up to white's aggression right and not find himself just cramped with uh 
little or no counterplay, which is no good either. So here, Tivikov plays bishop g7, so he continues his development. All right. Other alternatives here, in the spirit of keeping an eye on white's play and keeping uh, white honest or uh, castles queenside this avoids the uh, kingside attack from white and also uh it tends to highlight hey maybe whites can be attacked on the king side now with this opposite wing castling and this pawn so far advanced so for example uh, castle's queen side let's say queen e2 f5 f5 is interesting also but queen e2 uh, giving up that pawn on d4 queen takes d4 bishop e3 and this is just a sample line of course queen b4 and I like this move right here bishop takes c6 not so much for the the fork, we're not looking at the fork, but there's a more sinister idea behind this, right? We're not looking at uh, this move, but after B, uh, B takes E6, Queen A6, and this is winning uh, for white already. Okay, C7, because if he goes anywhere else now, then there's going to be the fork. So, for example, King B8. Knight takes c6, and now you can see. All right, so black has to be uh, careful, even uh, in that uh, s scenario of opposite wing castling. So, um, but going back uh, after bishop e3, queen b4. Bishop takes c6, of course, instead of taking the uh, bishop, black would counterattack on the king side. Knight takes d4, bishop takes b7, king takes b7, queen g2. You have a double-edged game here, but this is very much to the attacking player style many times, especially if you like confusion and chaos on the board. This is definitely one of those uh, positions. That's just a sample line that happens after uh, queenside castling from black. So I don't know who you would prefer here. I would prefer a uh, white in this position, right? I don't like the king safety of black there. So perhaps Tivyakov didn't like that either. Another more, um, uh, I guess, traditional or less chaotic approach would be h5. Again, trying to exploit. Uh, white's early aggression on the king side. All right. Dislodging this unified pair of pawns on the F and G file, right? Making it weaker by forcing a pawn to advance, right? I don't think black would like, uh, white would like to capture here at this point. So G5, knight G4, knight E4, queen C7. A4 again, just a sample line here. Queen D3. And the idea, of course, C4 is coming up soon. And there's the castle on the queen side. A5, King B8, and now uh, C4, which, of course, black can play here. Knight B4, or Knight takes E5 if you want. Knight B4, and let's say uh, Queen C3. So again, um, Double edge position. Uh, I would say white has the edge just due to his space advantage. Uh, can black exploit the um, the weakness on the uh, king side? Well, that's up up to um, up for debate. All right. The issue here is uh, white has a, a powerful knight on e5, uh, good space uh, space advantage, and um, it's hard for black to really uh, place his uh, pieces. Here, so interesting uh, position here. So back to the game. Um, Tivyakov chose bishop g7. Shirov boldly pressed on and played f5. 
g takes f5, g takes f5, and bishop c4 attacking the rook. Shirov gave up his knight on e5, play knight takes c4, knight takes c4, queen d3, and now we see this struggle for the initiative. However, at this point, Tivyakov has a nice move, and he just simply plays knight to g4, threatening mate in one. All right, so we can see it seems like Tivyakov, the Scandinavian specialist, it found a way to neutralize the early aggression of white. And it seems that Shirov's um, king side is uh, coming under fire here. Also, notice that um, Tivikov is not castled anywhere. So if he wants, he can utilize the G file, perhaps put his rook on G8 and attack now. All right. So it's like the hunter is now becoming the hunted. Here, Shirov plays rook F4. To block the mate. Uh, natural is bishop f4. However. Tactics are king in chess. And natural here just doesn't work. If uh, bishop f4 here. There's uh, two really good moves. And practically winning moves that black can make. One is just simply. Knight uh, takes b2. Since the b pawn is now unprotected. And the queen is also attacked here. The other move is just simply queen takes d4 check. And this is just a fantastic um, ending uh, for uh, black here. It brings the knight in. Right? Reminds us of the famous octopus uh, knight. And... Uh, Karpov Kasparov 1985 game 16 therefore after knight g4 Shirov played rook f4 so the b pawn is still protected nevertheless this is extremely awkward and it creates a, a situation whereby this bishop is overworked right having to protect b2 and f4 causes Tivikov to play knight takes b2 anyway so at this point, we can say that black is better. So Shirov made some uh, mistakes here. And I believe it probably started with the move f5. So queen g3. Bishop takes d4. King h1. And here, um, again, let me say black is definitely better here. Uh, he's, um, did very, he's done a good job of, uh, basically using white's aggression against him. And now it's Shirov who is fighting, uh, for his, um, chess life here. Tivyakov played knight f2. A lot of us, uh, probably would have played this, this move here. There's two alternatives I, I would like to share with you. One is, uh, bishop takes c3 here. Which is also good. Queen takes c3. And there's the use of the g file I was talking about. At the rook g8. Queen takes b2. Queen d1. Bishop f1. Knight e3. Queen e5. Knight takes. And um, this is this is good uh, for black also. Other alternative here is knight d1. Knight d1 attacks this piece twice, and you notice the rook on a1 is hanging, so that's the idea there. Knight can't really move without giving up the rook. So knight d1, bishop takes a1, and you can see the knight on d1 is hanging. So queen takes g4, captures the piece and protects, and we see this idea of queenside castling again. With Tempe, so rook f1, h5, and again, uh, black uh, has a better position here. And we can see again, utilizing the g file for his own devices. So those were two um, nice alternatives uh, in that position. 
that uh, were uh, playable. Okay. Knight d3 is another uh, idea. So plenty good moves here uh, for black. The idea here is simply if, uh, of course, if queen d3, then just simply queen takes f4, and then we use the old fork tactic after uh, bishop takes f4. Knight f2. That's the main idea. The other idea is after c takes d3, the defense is blocked by the capture of the pawn. So now the bishop can just capture without worry. And again, with Tempe, as the rook must move. So rook b1 and then black can anchor this knight with a move like h5 here. So three good alternatives. Tivyakov played a knight to f2 check. Shirov played rook takes f2. Queen takes g3 by Tivyakov, who loved to go loves to go into the end game. If you look at a lot of Tivyakov's games, you'll find that he likes um, calm positions. He's not really a, a um, chaotic. Um, uh, position lover so you will see in a lot of his games where uh, he will avoid complications and try to make things as clear uh, as possible and I've saw I've seen this on several occasions be used against him where a player will make the position um, complicated uh, and murky so where he would be better and but still would lose his way uh, with all the mess on the board so that's just something uh to keep keep in mind and there might be an observation you might come up with if you study enough uh, tivyakov's games as i have done um so anyway h takes g3 and here again tivyakov has played uh played is uh faced with the decision do you take the rook right it's a good choice bishop takes f2 Okay, and um, have material still be even on the board as far as the number of pieces, right? Although you'll be up in exchange. Or do you take the knight so you have two pieces to choose from? Or do you take the knight here and, uh, uh, and um, be, you know, uh, be up material? So here, uh, Tivikov played bishop takes c3. All right, and this is uh, where I feel he should have just taken the rook here. So my line goes, bishop takes f2, bishop takes b2, rook g8, knight e4, and just play simple chess, bishop takes g3. And here, bishop d4, bishop to c7 there's the castle bishop c5 and rook g e8 with a good uh, solid uh, position so here we can see black is up the exchange so he's kind of down material so i could see why tivikov may have wanted to avoid that position with white having the two bishops etc but um He's up two pawns. So the position is complicated. And this is what I was saying is that it's it's still kind of murky, right? This material imbalance. Yes, um he's down um he's up the exchange, but he also has the two pawns. White looks pretty active. So he tries to go into a more clear uh situation and he plays bishop takes c three. Now, rook b1, knight c4, and this allows rook takes b7. Knight a5, rook c7, and now you see Shirov getting active in the position. And now this is the type of player 
again with the um, lineage of Tao, um, you don't want to see him get really being active in a position. Because it's hard to stop players like this once they get an initiative. So Rook D8. And he just loses his pawn. So you might say, why would he just give up the pawn? Well, there's too much pressure in the position. So for example, if he did King D8 instead, then just simply Bishop F4. Say F6. And the material is going to just start dropping. Rook E2. H5, for example. King G2. Getting off the H file. Rook H7. C5. Bishop B6. And of course, then Rook D5. And we can see how um, white is now better. Right? He has his space advantage from earlier. And he's more active. Black's pieces are quite awkward looking in this variation. Instead of king d8, he could have also tried bishop e5. Again, being more direct, but then just simply rook takes c6. And you have the tactic here available because of the position of the king and rook. So if knight takes, then just simply... Bishop takes, and white will be winning there. So bishop e5, rook takes c6, rook b8, rook a6, bishop takes g3. Again, this is a sample line. Again, white is in control. So, Tivikov decides to jettison that pawn immediately and... Play active. Rook takes a7. And now rook d7. Again trying to resolve the the situation immediately. Rook d8. And trying to get to a clear uh, a game. Where white doesn't have this initiative. But Shira finds a way. He keeps attacking. The uh, white pieces are somewhat uh, better than the black pieces. Right, he has a bishop here. The knight on a5 is looking a little shady, misplaced. And now the rook on uh, h8 is still out of the game. And it's interesting that a few moves ago, uh, black's position looked so, um, you know, dominating. So rook a7, again, rook back on the uh, uh, seventh rank. Pawn drops, and we can see the drifting into... Um, a lost game uh, by Tivyakov here. Knight takes f5. g4 by uh, Shirov. Knight d4 attacking knight. Bishop a4. And now you see Shirov consolidating. h5. g5. He won't even let uh, this rook become active. And it's amazing how things turned around that quick. Knight e Knight e2, rook d7 check, king f8, so another pawn is going to drop. Rook takes e7, knight g3, and who knows, Tivyakov could have been in time trouble at this point because his play deteriorated. King g2, bishop c7, and just simply rook takes c7, and he's going to go with the uh, bishops against the rook at the end. Tivyakov could resign already, but... Probably just playing on adrenaline here. And after bishop b2, he finally uh, resigned here. All right, so definitely powerful uh, late middle game play uh, by Shirov here. But hey, let us not um, forget that at this point, uh, I do believe that black was holding the upper hand. And definitely bishop uh, takes b2 was a little better so can we attribute this win to the opening per se from share no because um at the end of the day uh white uh did drift into a uh, worse uh, position but i attribute that to this move f5 early i think it was just a little bit on the ambitious ambitious side of of for Sherov. so 
this setup right here I don't believe is bad but maybe maybe F5 was just asking a little too much too early in the game maybe a little bit uh, more uh, preparation uh, but nevertheless Shirov was able to get the victory in, um, in 2008 so that's what year this game was from uh, the tournament is the Benidorm Stars and in Spain and it says number seven so I didn't even know there was uh first Benidorm stars but this is Benidorm stars number seven so in round eight so this brings us to our um our second uh meeting between uh Shirov and Tivyakov so our second meeting uh took place at the uh Univ Crown Group this is round two, and this was two years later, in October 26, 2010. So, again, two years have passed. Shirov again has the white pieces. Tivyakov with the black pieces, and they go right into the same line. And I'm sure Tivyakov had time to look at this and um, analyze everything just as we had done. So... He's willing to go right back into the line as he probably feels that his loss had nothing to do with the opening. Shirov goes right into the same line too and plays the move F4, Knight B6, G4. So obviously Shirov believes in this line. Knight uh, BD5, Bishop G2, same line G6, and here Shirov deviates so Shirov obviously probably looked at uh, his notes or uh, his suggestions from that game and probably wiped the sweat off his forehead and said hey maybe uh, that F5 move that idea was a little uh, too ambitious um, here Shirov just simply played G5 the first game if you remember it went castles and Bishop G7 at this point and then he tried to go with F5 so here is Shirov's alternative move or should we say improvement he just plays the move G5 immediately Tivyakov exchanges once again plays knight takes c3 b takes c3 knight d5 so he has a similar idea he exchanges some pieces which is uh, normal in the correct position for the side with less space he exchanges a pair of knights and he plays the knight to the center with tempo so um, what more can you ask for in this type of position another idea of course is just knight d7 And again, this is the type of position that, um, again, is pretty, pretty cramped, right? And uh, basically provokes White to to uh, continue uh, his his attacking um, methods. So, but Knight D7 is an alternative. Instead, he played Knight D5, and the reason why I showed you Knight D7 as an alternative is because Knight D5, although it's good. To be able to hop in the, into the center, he can't stay there, right? Unless he was able to have this move, right? Play two moves in a row and solidify the uh, the knight on d5. Uh, he can't stay there and immediately Shirov plays c4. Grabbing more space, knight c7. And now c5. So just basically playing super aggressive pushing black back black has to find a way to um, utilize these weak squares uh, somehow in the position all right so we see d5 f5 are definitely squares that he could possibly occupy eventually even break down the uh, the advanced pawns on the king side with moves like h6 or f f6 sometime if uh, necessary but Shirov does not give Tivyakov a chance to breathe. 
And this is how you have to play when you play these hyper-aggressive lines like this. There's a lot of weakness inherent in the white position. Okay, so the mentality has to be to strive for the initiative at all costs. It's almost like playing a gambit, but without actually gambiting the pawn. But your mindset has to be uh, in that aggressive um, frame of mind where you're willing to, to sacrifice. Because, listen... You're not sacrificing a pawn, but you've pretty much sacrificed position. So you must play with the same attitude. Like, hey, if this goes to, you know, uh, to the ending right now, I'll, I'll probably be, probably be busted. Okay, so maybe that's a little exaggerated, but you get what I'm saying. You have to play with urgency when you have these type of weaknesses in the position, or black will just simply consolidate and unravel. So after c5, queen d8, can you find white's next move? You think Shirov played rook b1? You think Shirov just castled? These are fine alternative moves, but this is a disciple of Tao. And he just presses on. He plays d5. He's going to blow uh, black off the board. That's what he wants to do, right? He wants to, he wants to punish him for bringing that queen out early. All right, Shirov plays in the in a style where he's saying he it's almost like he hates the Scandinavian opening. That's how he that's how he's playing. Like almost like how dare you play this opening against me? He shows great contempt of the opening over the board. I see. So d5. C takes d5 is played by Tivikov. Of course, the alternative is knight takes d5. But since the pawns are doubled, we see. The positive side of double pawns here because white just simply pushes the other pawn to c4. Double pawns can be great, especially in the middle game. You have the initiative because they take up so much uh, space, right? They can guard a lot of squares. And the idea here is simply knight c7, queen d8, and after king takes, knight f7, right? King is over here and you see knight f7. The only other reasonable alternative is knight b4. Again, same idea. King takes d8, knight takes f7, check. And this is also going to work out in white's favor. Black, White could even take time to play rook b1 if he wanted to. But more straightforward is just knight takes h8. Black could try to copy cat, but it's not quite the same because he ends up losing material in the end. So again, there's more variations that you could look at there, but that's just a sample. So suffice it to say that Black is in trouble after knight uh, d5. So this is why Tivikov chose c takes d5. He's trying to um, calm the storm. C4, Shirov is still um, coming. Banging on that door. Opening up. Open the door. Open the door. He's coming like the SWAT team. So C4, E6. So just take a moment uh, and look at Black's position. Right? Pawn structure is pristine. Right? But he has um, practically zero development. And White has a ton of ton of space okay he has a ton ton of space so um this this is um a position where black has to be super super uh careful for example instead of e6 d4 then just simply queen a4 check and guess what black is already lost in this position say bishop d7 for example c6 again using those double pawns b takes bishop takes and black is lost trust me on that this is why tv call played e6 alexei just got on the diagonal and played bishop b2 and here to me the the best move um 
for black is probably Rook G8. All the yeah, definitely Rook G8 here. Although white is still better. I mean, this is not what um, Tivikov dreamed up or analyzed or prepared to uh, play for. So, for example, Rook G8. Of course, he didn't play that. Bishop D4 protects the uh, C pawn. Bishop G7. Queen E2, and thus we can just see the space advantage. Rook B1. And after all, right, isn't this what the whole uh, white side, you know, the whole white argument against the early uh, capture of the D pawn with the queen about, right? Gaining time and space as a result of these early uh, queen maneuvers. So I find that in this variation, you see that uh illustrated in its purest form c takes a takes again we're looking at a sample variation here and of course improvements can be made but i just wanted to give you an idea of what's going on uh, in these positions here so rook g8 is is um is to me no doubt uh, Black's best alternative. Not a, it's not a good alternative, but uh, it's probably better than the game continuation. And like I said, improvements can be made in this small variation. But I just wanted you to get the main idea. So, for instance, instead of Bishop D4 here protecting that pawn, moves like Knight G4 can be played with the Knight coming to F6. So just already, you can see improvements uh in the position already i think i think black is in a lot of trouble in this position so instead of rook g8 he played bishop g7 all right and we can see the piece is not protected of course tivikov saw this but he's trying to choose the lesser of evils at this point so knight c6 attacking the queen Obviously, the queen is more valuable than the bishop, so he grabs the knight over there, drops a bishop. Rook g8. Bishop comes out to e5, and of course, this is a terrible position for black. Bishop d7. Bishop doesn't get any worse than that. The only way you can make that light square bishop worse is by putting the pawn on b7. And that's not saying too much. Shirov castles. Rook b8. Queen a4. And you just start probing on the queen side. Rook b7. Rook a b1. And this game is beautiful because Tivikov gets put in sort of Zug's wing in this position. So queen c8. Rook takes b7. Even stronger is move like queen a5. But you can, you'll see the same ideas. So for example, queen a5, king d8. And just simply rook takes here. And then rook f2. And the idea is to just simply transfer this rook to b2 so let's say rook f2 let's just make like some like a okie doke kind of move like king d8 and you have rook b2 here And there's really nothing that um, black can do at this point. The queen is attacked. The queen moves. Then the knight gets picked up. The only alternative is like moves like this. Which of course is drop material. So the game kind of goes in that fashion. So queen c8. Rook takes b7. He gets rid of that. Queen takes b7. And you can see the same scenario. The only difference is that the queen is not on a5 
rook f2. The reason why he has to do rook f2 is, of course, he can't immediately go here because there's nothing protecting that rook. So he goes to f2 because the bishop will protect the rook here, the bishop on uh, e5. The same idea can be found with this move queen c2, of course. Because with queen c2, now the rook can just go here. Anyway, queen takes b7, rook f2, d4. Why did uh, Tivikov play d4? Because it blocks the action of the bishop guarding this square. <clears throat> and of course, bishop takes d4 can be played. However, uh, Shirov played queen a5, just double attacking here. And now king d8. And then he played bishop e4. And uh, uh, here, uh, Tivikov uh, just simply uh, resigned at this point. So there's, there's too many uh, too many good moves that can uh, be played at this point. So, for example, you know, just simply bishop takes d4 could be played. Rook b2. Rook b2 can be played anyway. Because of the, uh, yeah, I'll just show you. So, as you can see, the queen cannot capture. So, and the queen cannot really go away from the protection of the knight. So, the only move is queen to c, um, c8. And um, here you can play queen takes uh, a7 here with the idea of bringing the rook to b8. Or you could just play a move like this, bishop f6 check. King here. And now queen to a7. Again, with this idea of the rook uh, coming down uh, to b8. All right, so those were the two games I wanted to show you between Shirov and uh, Tivyakov. Uh, the latter, definitely, the, the, the second game, the one I just showed you, definitely, uh, definitely a devastating statement by Shirov. Um, he definitely, um, definitely gave Tivikov, uh, something to think about in this preparation against that line. Um, you don't see too many games, uh, with that line. Um, I looked at... All of the Tivyakov games that I can find, but I only looked at the wins and losses. I didn't look at all the draws. So I looked at all the Tivyakov games I can find in the center um, in the Scandinavian. And I only found Shirov uh, playing that line. But, I mean, there's so many games I, I might have overlooked uh, some. But uh, these two games by Shirov definitely, uh, definitely are convincing uh, to me that the line is definitely dangerous and playable and what I like about it it's a little bit on the off beaten um, the, you know a little bit off the uh, beaten trail there so you can kind of you know learn it it's simple to learn the idea is very simple you know that basically you're just cramping 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 white and um, you will have it endorsed by a top player uh, such as Shirov. Of course, to be fair, in the first game, uh, Tivikov did have the upper hand, but Shirov found an improvement in the next game. Instead of uh, instead of you know castling here on move ten, he just went forward with the g5, and I'm sure that I don't think there's anything wrong with castling. Like I said, it's probably the move f5 uh, per se. So. Um, you know, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please uh, thumbs up, like, subscribe, comment. All of, all of those things serve to move the video forward in the Google algorithm so that it can be seen by more people uh, when they look for uh, chess or search Scandinavian defense uh, on YouTube. They can see uh, these uh, lessons. Also, down below are links to DVDs. If you want to watch, like, the more professional DVDs on um this opening or even books they'll be all in the links below also i want you guys to know that um i'm on facebook i'm sorry not facebook um twitter 
Same name, Chess Audiobooks. Um, and also on Live Chess, same name too, Chess Audiobooks. So you can, uh, you know, um, follow me on there. I will play you. Um, I only play one minute games because I'm paranoid about people using computers in the longer games. So I will play one minute speed games. Um, so, uh, yeah, with that said, uh, yeah, please, uh, uh, stay tuned and we're going to be making more videos. I am going to be looking at some more Scandinavian games from Tiviakov and don't worry, it's not going to be all losses. I'm going to be looking at his, his victories too, because he definitely, um, you know, uh, represented, uh, for this, uh, argument, uh, for one D five. So with that, I'll see you guys on the next video.